making an object jump in Unity seems like it should be fairly straightforward, until you actually try to do it. This isn't because it's a very difficult or complicated thing to do, it's not really, but there can be a lot to consider. For example, will you use Unity's built-in physics to make your object jump, or will you move your object manually? And how can you manage the speed and height of a jump so that it feels right in your game and so that a player can only jump as far as they're supposed to? In this video, you'll learn a few of the different methods you can use to make an object jump in Unity, so that you can choose the one that makes the most sense for your game and how it's supposed to work. So how do you make an object jump in Unity? Generally speaking, there are two main ways to jump in Unity. You can use Unity's physics engine, which typically involves applying an amount of force to an object to move it up, allowing it to fall again under gravity. Or you can make an object jump manually, without physics, by simulating its vertical movement yourself using code. Which method is best depends entirely on how you want your project to feel, and how you want movement to work. For example, writing your own jump physics, while it can be a lot of work, can be useful if you want to create unnatural movements, extremely tight controls, or if, for whatever reason, you want to avoid using physics simulation. Whereas if your game already uses physics heavily, or if you want to simulate realistic object collisions, or if you simply don't want to have to make your own physics system, using Unity's built-in physics can be a good place to start. However, while the two methods are different, the general principle is still the same. Upwards movement against the gravitational force, which is typically easier to recreate using physics than without. So let's start there. Unity's physics engine allows you to move objects under physics simulation, which can be useful for making an object jump. However, by default, most objects you create aren't affected by physical forces. For example, an object with a collider component attached to it does have a physical presence in the world, but with only a collider, it's not technically supposed to move. To move an object using physics, you'll need to add a rigid body component. A rigid body component, or a rigid body 2D component if you're working with a 2D physics engine, is essentially a physics movement component, and will cause an object to be moved by physical forces such as gravity. It also means that you can apply a force to the rigid body, manually, to move it or make it jump. This works by using the add force function. Add force works by applying an amount of force to a rigid body represented as a directional vector. In 3D, add force takes a vector 3 value, while when working in 2D, it takes a vector 2, that's equal to the direction and strength of the force that will be applied, such as an upwards force, for example, which can be passed in using the shorthand vector two up or transform up, which is up relative to the world and object respectively, multiplied by a modifier, which allows you to control the jump strength. By default, add force applies force over time, building momentum like a rocket would, which isn't really appropriate for making an object jump. Instead, the impulse force mode allows you to apply force to a rigid body in one hit, such as when the jump button is pressed, for example, making the object jump. However, while this works, the jump that it produces is floaty, which, unless that's what you want in your game, is probably too slow for most uses, since it takes several seconds to complete. So how can you fix a floaty jump? One way to increase the speed of a jump is to increase the effect of gravity on the object. Increasing the gravity value will cause objects to fall faster, which, while this means they will also require more force to achieve the same jump, will also make the overall movement much quicker. However, increasing the speed of a physics object can cause problems. Fast-moving objects will often start to move through other objects before their position is corrected in the next physics update, causing the object to spring back from the ground. Changing the rigid body's collision detection mode to continuous instead of the default discrete value fixes this, improving the quality of the object's collision detection and preventing it from getting stuck in the environment, while enabling interpolation smooths out the physics movement's fixed update position changes, making the jump movement smoother even though it's typically processed at a lower frame rate than update. While increasing the global gravity value does work to make a jump faster, you might not want to change the gravity of every object in your game. When working in 2D, instead of changing all the gravity in your game, it's possible to change how a specific object interprets gravity by changing the rigid body's gravity scale, where a higher value means that the object will fall faster and harder than other objects in the game, allowing you to change how one object moves without interfering with the physics of the world in general. Which can be useful if, for example, you want to apply more gravity when an object is falling than when it's moving upwards. But why would you want to do that? 
Many games use jump curves that take as long going up as they do coming down, meaning that increasing the gravity scale of an object may be all you need to do to get the jump that you want. However, some games choose to implement a faster fall, where the player takes longer jumping upwards than they do falling. One way to do this is applying different levels of gravity depending on if the object is moving up or down. It works by checking if the vertical velocity of the rigid body is positive or negative, switching the gravity scale automatically. Just like when changing the global gravity value, when you change the gravity of a specific object, you'll also need to change the amount of force that you use to make it jump, in order to reach the same height. However, instead of entering the jump force as an arbitrary value, and then tweaking it, it's possible to calculate the amount of force you'll need to use based on the height of the jump you want to achieve. This can be useful for managing which areas the player can reach by keeping jump height consistent no matter what else you change. So how does it work? To make an object jump to a specific height, you'll need to calculate the force that's required to reach it based on the mass of the object and the gravity of the world. Specifically, the square root of the target height multiplied by gravity multiplied by minus two and scaled by the object's mass. The result is a calculated jump force based on the height in units that you want the player to be able to jump to. And while it's not a perfect method, as the measured height will often be a little lower than the target, it is very consistent, meaning that the actual jump that's created will be the same height every time the button is pressed. However, while limiting the height of the jump is useful, always jumping to the same height can make moving around your game quite difficult to do which is why it's usually a good idea to allow the player to control the height of their jump, depending on how long the jump button was pressed for. There are a number of different ways to create a variable jump, but they all generally involve the same two steps. Detecting if the player released the jump button early, and altering the trajectory of the jump if they did. Most jump buttons are on-off inputs, meaning that measuring the jump input typically involves recording how long the button was pressed for using a timer. For example, if the duration of the time that the jump button is pressed for, the button press time, is smaller than the window of time required to perform a full jump, the button press window, then the jump is cancelled and the trajectory of the jump is reduced. Typically it needs to work this way round, because the impulse force method that is required to perform the jump is applied in a single frame, meaning that by the time a jump is cancelled, the player will have already started moving upwards. Meaning that if you want to then reduce the trajectory of the jump, you'll need to counteract the upwards momentum that the object already has. One way to do this is by using the rigid body's gravity scale. In the same way that the gravity scale can be used to make an object fall faster, it can be used to make an object rise more slowly, achieving a lower peak height. This works by applying an increased gravity scale if the player releases the jump button inside of the button press window. Then, when the player reaches the peak of the jump and starts moving downwards again, the falling gravity scale is applied finishing the jump. Alternatively, it's possible to reduce the peak of a jump by applying a downwards force against the object if the jump is cancelled early. For example, the add force method in force mode, which applies a gradual force, not a sudden one, can be used to smoothly alter the trajectory of a jump until the object is no longer moving upwards. This can be useful if you're creating a slower jump, as it creates a smoother change of direction, or if you're jumping in 3D, where the gravity scale method isn't an option. Other methods include altering the velocity of the rigid body directly. The velocity of a rigid body is its current movement trajectory, meaning that you wouldn't normally change it yourself, since doing so could cause unusual physics or interrupt the momentum of an object. However, setting it manually can be useful for creating a variable jump. It works by setting the velocity to an upwards trajectory for as long as the jump button is held. What this does is override the effect of gravity since the actual velocity of the object keeps getting reset. Then when it's released, gravity starts to take effect again, and the object begins to fall, creating a variable trajectory depending on how long the button was held. Unity's built-in physics engine can make building a jump system easier, since many of the features you're likely to need already exist. But what if you don't want to use Unity physics? Making an object jump in Unity without physics is generally very similar to the process of making something jump with physics. For example, it's possible to use the same force calculations used to make a physics object jump, except that instead of moving a rigid body, you'll need to move the object directly using its transform component. So how does it work? Physics objects move with momentum, where a force that's applied once, to make an object jump for example, maintains its velocity until other forces such as gravity 
gradually cause it to fall. For a non-physics object, it's possible to create your own object momentum by storing an object's vertical velocity in a float value. Then, when a force is applied to the object, such as the force required to make it jump, instead of moving it directly, its velocity value is changed. The velocity value is then passed into the translate function, which creates relative momentum-based movement. But, without an opposing force, the object will move upwards forever, meaning that you're going to need to create some gravity. To create gravity without physics, you'll need to apply an increasing amount of downward force to the velocity of your object when it's in the air. This can be calculated by multiplying the gravity value, which could be the physics system's default gravity value of minus 9.81, multiplied by a gravity scale, and then multiplied by delta time, twice. Why twice? Gravity is not a constant speed, it's an acceleration measured in meters per second squared. Multiplying gravity by delta time twice squares the time value, which when added to the object's velocity, applies an increasing opposing force to the object, creating gravity. However, there's a problem with this method. When using physics, collisions between objects are detected automatically. However, when moving an object manually, even if both objects have colliders attached to them, their collisions are ignored, allowing one object to be moved through another. This happens because collider components only define the bounds of an object's physical presence in the world. Any actual collisions between colliders only take place when at least one of them has a rigid body attached and is being moved under physics simulation. Because the object doesn't have a rigid body, or even its own collider, you'll need to manually detect collisions with the world. The first part of this process is to perform a ground check. A ground check is simply a method of testing whether or not the player is on the ground at any given time. When building any kind of jumping system, with or without physics, you'll typically always need some kind of ground check to prevent the player from being able to jump when they're not supposed to. When creating a manual jump, without physics, ground checks can also be used to disable gravity when the player is on the floor, stopping them from falling through it. There are a number of different ways to perform a ground check, but typically involves checking to see if there's a collider under the player. This can be done using a raycast to fire a line downwards from the object, returning any colliders that are hit. Which works, but unless you use a shaped raycast, such as a sphere cast or a box cast, it can mean that the area of detection is very small, causing an object to easily fall off the edge of platforms. When working in 2D, you could use an overlap box to detect colliders at the base of the player. An easy way to do this is using a separate sprite, which allows you to see where the box will be and makes entering the position and size values easier to do. The contact filter is a required parameter of the overlap box function that allows you to ignore or include particular colliders from being detected, while the result parameter allows you to record a reference to any colliders that are found in a local array. If a collider is found, then the overlap box function will return the total number of colliders as an integer, up to the length of the array, in this case, one. Then if it's more than zero, that means the player is standing on something and is grounded. When this happens, the velocity of the object is set back to zero, preventing the object from falling under gravity. However, there is one last problem to solve. Physics objects correct their positions when their momentum causes them to begin to pass through one another. The same problem can happen when jumping without physics, as an object falling under gravity may only realise it's grounded after it started to move through the floor. One way to fix this is to snap a grounded object to the surface it's on using the closest point function. This returns a position on the surface of the collider that's closest to the centre of the object. Then move the vertical position of the object to the surface point plus an offset to allow for the height of the object. This will snap the object back to its correct position on top of the floor and not inside it. However, all of this will only work if each step is carried out in the correct order. First, add gravity to the object's velocity. Remember that adding velocity doesn't actually move the object, it only changes the intended trajectory of the object for when it is moved later in the frame. Next, see if the object is grounded. If it is, reset the velocity of the object to zero and snap it to the floor. Next, if the player does jump, apply any new jumping velocity after gravity and ground checks. This prevents a new jump from being cancelled out because the object is grounded. Finally, move the object using the translate function, passing in the velocity value as a vertical vector. 
While the techniques in this video can be used to create the basic mechanics of a jump, exactly how good or not a jump system is depends entirely on how it feels to play. For example, a basic jumping system, while effective, can be unforgiving and frustrating. It's easy to miss platforms, miss timed jumps, or worst of all, fail to detect an input that the player feels they should have been given. Which is why many games implement a range of advanced features that help make jumping easier and feel better. For more information on advanced platforming features, try David Strachan's interactive article or Tarot Dev's video and downloadable example, both of which are linked in the video description. Now I want to hear from you. How are you making objects jump in your game? Are you using physics or are you moving objects using their transform components? And what have you learned about making objects jump in Unity that you know someone else would find helpful? Whatever it is, let me know by leaving a comment below, like this video if you found it useful, and get subscribed for more videos from me. I'll see you next time.